Hello all, I'm glad to welcome you all for today's webinar on the genomics of familial hypercholesterolemia. Familial hypercholesterolemia is one of the most common genetic disorders, but also it is one of the highly underdiagnosed conditions in most countries. So for today's session, we have with us here, Mr. Mohammed Imran, who has completed his bachelor's and master's in biotechnology from Bharatidasan University, Tamil Nadu. He is currently a senior research fellow in Dr. Sridhar Sivasubhu's lab at CSIR IGIB, and his primary research interest focuses on understanding the genetic epidemiology of various monogenic dyslipidemias in India. We welcome you, Imran, and over to you. Thank you, Mercy, for your kind introduction. Hello, everyone. I welcome you all once again for this webinar series. Here I'll be talking about genomics of familial hypercholesterolemia, its diagnosis, its treatment, and further future prospects of it. So to start, let's have a uh, discussion of a very interesting story about Mona Lisa. It, of course, um, we all know that this masterpiece was actually painted by Leonardo da Vinci, a famous Italian artist. And apart from being an artist, he is also a very good scientist and uh, has made a remarkable scientific work on atherosclerosis. In 1503, Leonardo started painting of uh, Madonna, Madonna Lisa Maria, also known as Mona Lisa. And this painting is very famous for its realistic portrait. And how many of you know that Mona Lisa can be a probable case for family hypercholesterolemia? And yes. And if you can see the image, you will be see, able to see a nodule around her uh, right uh, side of her eye. And uh, you will be able to see a swelling on her upper part of her right hand. The nodule is xanthalasma and the swelling is subcutaneous lipoma. This observation was actually made several years later and it is one of the clinical manifestations for feminine hypercholesterolemia. And of course, Mona Lisa might be a first probable case of familial hypercholesterolemia to be reported. So, what is familial hypercholesterolemia? It is one of the most common genetic disease in mankind itself, and it is one of the most common genetic cause for cardiovascular diseases. Affected patients will have a very high level of LDL throughout their lifetime, and this high level of LDL and accumulation of it will cause atherosclerosis plague, and it is an independent risk factor for causing cardiovascular diseases. It is suspected that around 30 million individuals may have FH um, across worldwide and every minute a child is born with this genetic condition. But unfortunately, less than 1% are being actually diagnosed in most of the countries and result, FH is one of the most common underdiagnosed genetic disorders also. When we talk about the history, almost 80 years ago, in 1937, Carl Muller described patients uh, who presented with xanthoma tuberosum and also with angina pectoris. And he expressed that hypercholesteremia is an important factor for causing heart disease. Also, he stated that this condition could have a hereditary predisposition. In Later in 1981, Brown and uh, Goldstein made a landmark discovery by unraveling the genetic cause behind familial hypercholesteremia. For this work, they won Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1985. And to start with the basics and to know more about these lipids and uh, lipoproteins. So what is a lipid? A lipid is a biomolecule which are actually insoluble in water. And we are familiar with these two uh, plasma lipids that is cholesterol and triglycerides. They are clinically very important lipids. And as I told earlier, these lipids are insoluble in water and they should travel through the bloodstream. So they are sequestered uh, within a transport vehicle known as lipoprotein. And this is a lipoprotein, and the and this is a cross-sectional view of the same lipoprotein. So in this uh, lipoprotein, you have a phospholipid monolayer surrounding it, and in between the phospholipid monolayer, there are proteins associated with this. This protein is known as apolipoproteins. So within this confined layer, there are triglycerides and cholesterols are confined with this. So this whole constitutes to a lipoprotein. So there are five major classes of lipoprotein based upon their size and composition, starting with the chylomicrons, which constitutes around 90% of triglycerides and 5% of cholesterol. And next is very low density lipoprotein, 
which has 65% of triglycerides within it and 20% of cholesterol uh, within it. And next is intermediate density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein and high density lipoprotein. If you see through this um, three, uh, across this image, the size of a lipoprotein decrease um, across as we go and also the cholesterol also increases uh, across the image. And LDL is the one which actually has high L level of um, cholesterol, which is around 50% when compared to the all other uh, lipoproteins. Now we will see how these lipoproteins are actually playing a major role in the lipid metabolic pathway. So whenever we ingest food, the dietary lipids within the food will be taken in the intestine and these lipids will be further packed uh, into chylomicrons that is also a lipoprotein. These chylomicrons will be pushed through the bloodstream and after this chylomicron will be further reduced to chylomicron remnants. These remnants will be transported to the liver and in the liver, uh, beside this uh, dietary cholesterol, liver itself will produce endogenous cholesterol through HMG CVO reductase pathway and also triglyceroids um, and also other upper lipoproteins. So together with this dietary cholesterol and also endogenous cholesterol, triglycerides and upper lipoproteins, the VLDL synthesis will happen and this VLDL uh, will be secreted to, through, through the uh, bloodstream and this VLDL particle will be further hydrolyzed to intermediate density lipoprotein. This intermediate density lipoprotein will be further hydrolyzed by lipoprotein enzyme uh, to low density lipoprotein. As I said, this lower density lipoprotein, which has high level of uh, cholesterol within it, around 50%. Also, this is the uh, lipoprotein which actually transfers the cholesterol to other peripheral tissue and also to other muscle tissues. Also, this same LDL, uh, the, it transfers the cholesterol to back into the liver via LDL receptors. And there is one more lipoprotein known as high density lipoprotein. Uh, which plays a major role in reverse transport cholesterol. So wherever there's an excess cholesterol in the tissue, it will be taken uh, by the HDL and it will be again put back into the liver through HDL. So now we will look uh, a brief overview of how uh, LDL pathway works. So LDL is a ligand and its receptor will be seen in, in the on the surface, LDL receptor. Now uh, once the LDL is bound to this receptor, it will uh, get internalized and endosomes will be formed. And after this, the LDL which is bound to the receptor will get unbound and this unbound LDL will be further utilized in the cell. The free LDL uh, LDL, uh, LDL receptor will be recycled back uh, uh, onto the cell surface and it will be uh, free to bind uh, upcoming LDLs. So what happens if you have a genetic perturbation in the LDL receptor itself? So one is the LDL might not be able to bind to the receptor or it might not be able to internalize it or it might not be able to unbound the LDL from, from the receptor. So in any of this scenario, the result is that accumulation or elevation of LDL. So wherever there's an accumulation of this LDL will cause an atherosclerosis, development of atherosclerosis plague and leads to coronary artery diseases. And com coming to the uh, genetics part of uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, familial hypercholesterolemia is an autosomal co-dominant disorder and it is majorly caused by three major genes, uh, that is LDLR, PCSK, and ApoB. That is, if you have one mutation in any of this gene, pathogenic mutation in any of this gene, that is known as heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, you will have that disease. Also, if you have a few mutation, two mutations in Two of the alleles, either as combo heterozygous or in the homozygous form it's, uh, itself, you will have homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Similarly, you will have the same uh, uh, homozygous phenotype uh, in double heterozygous mutation. That is, you will have one mutation in one gene and another mutation in the another gene. So this uh, is known as double heterozygous, and the uh, patient will have a phenotype similar to of homozygous. So. Heterozygous FH uh, is very common, as I asserted, as I said earlier, um, across worldwide, 30 million populations may have um, FH, heterozygous FH, and homozygous FH is actually very rare, and it is also very severe. Almost 30 to 60% of patients who are clinically defined as FH have mutation in these three genes, 
and among these three genes, LDLR constitutes more than 90% of the mutations, also followed by APOV 5 to 10% and uh, PCSK9 being the least, that is around 1%. So besides this 30 to 60% of uh, patients uh, who are clinically defined as FH, that 20 to, uh, 10 to 20% of patients may have polygenic origin and another risk 20% of cases where the genetic causes unknown or yet to be discovered. And if you correlate the uh, genetics with the LDL levels, so this is the LDL levels in uh, Mg per deciliter. So clinically, if a patient has 500 to 1000 uh, levels of LDL, he is uh, clinically diagnosed to be of having homozygous FH, while if it is less than that uh, 500, he, uh, he is considered to be having clinically heterozygous FH. Also, if a patient has uh, 132 or 190 uh, level of LDLs, he may have uh, polygenic hypercholesterolemia, also known as common hypercholesterolemia. But if you see this um, in, in the molecular perspective, so the homozygous patient may have a homozygous mutation uh, in LDLR or in any other gene. Also, there is a, for a homozygous, there is a gene known as LDLR AP1. It, it uh, mutation in that also causes uh, homozygous female hypercholesterolemia. Well, and you may have a compound heterozygous mutation or you may have a double heterozygous mutation as I explained earlier. And coming to the heterozygous part where the uh, patient might have any uh, mutation in any one of these three genes. Also, coming to the polygenic, the, uh, in, in this, the patient may have a, a common uh, SNPs and each common SNP may have a significant uh, increase in the presence of such common uh, LDLs may have a a significant increase in LDLC levels. So, in conclusion, so if you have an additional pathogenic variant, that is, if you have one variant, the LDL levels are around in this range. And if you have an additional one more variant, that is, uh, it may be a homozygous or component heterozygous or a double heterozygous, they may have a very severe phenotype, that is, homozygous FH, and which is also correspond that they will have more higher risk for developing coronary artery diseases. So talking about the prevalence of female hypercholesterolemia in general population um, worldwide, uh, it, it is, uh, the prevalence is around one, uh, one in 313 individuals. And if there are seven populations, founder populations are there, such as uh, French Canadians and South Africans, the prevalence are said to be around one in 80. And if you could see the same prevalence in the patient cohorts, such as uh, patients cohorts who are having uh, ischemic heart disease, the prevalence is actually tenfold higher. That is around one in thirty-one. Also, uh, in the patient cohorts of uh, premature ischemic heart diseases, the prevalence is actually twenty-fold higher, and that is around one in fifteen. Also, similarly, in the patient cohorts of severe hypercholesterolemia, the uh, the prevalence is around one in fourteen. And these are the, some of the general clinical manifestations of familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, it can be seen in skin, eyes, and uh, other systemic organs. So in the skin, uh, the cholesterol deposits will be seen as uh, nodules. Uh, so this is also known as xanthalus meta. So if the nodule is present in uh, tendon, uh, tendons of the knees or uh, in the fingers, so then it is known as tendon xanthometa, or if it is in the palm region, uh, then it is known as palmar xanthometa. Likewise, uh, the presence of the no, uh, xanthoma uh, in, uh, can be seen in the uh, several uh, regions. Also in the eyes, the cholesterol deposit can be seen around the cornea as, a, uh, as like a white ring. This is known as corneal arcus. And also in other systemic organs, such as like uh, in retinal veins, uh, the this cholesterol uh, can be uh, it, it will be deposited in the retinal veins and this is known as leukemia retinitis. Similarly, it can be seen in other systemic organs also. So there are several diagnostic uh, criteria have been proposed uh, for family hypercholesterolemia. There is no universal uh, diagnostic criteria for such uh, like that for uh, FH. And uh, but, but most of the diagnostic criteria takes uh, in accounts of uh, patients' LDL levels and also patient's clinical manifestation, family history, and genetic testing uh, if available. One of the widely used 
diagnostic criteria is the Dutch lipid clinical network criteria. It in it involves variables such as um, taking family history of the patient, clinical history of the patient, and also the clinical manifestation seen in the patients, and uh, finally the LDL levels, and uh, also the genetic testing. So each variable carries a particular score, which is seen here, and cumulative of such score leads to the diagnosis of FH. For example, if a patient um, cumulative score is less than three, he is unlikely to be uh, having FH. And if the same patient, if another patient has a cumulative score of around three to five, then he is said to be so it to be have um, possible diagnosis for familial hypercholesterolemia. Similarly, for the patient has six to eight, uh, it leads to probable. And uh, if it is more than eight, it leads to definitive diagnosis for familial hypercholesterolemia. And as you see here, among all the variables, genetic testing carries the maximum points that is eight, and it may lead to, along with the LDL levels, it may lead to definitive diagnosis for familial hypercholesterolemia. And we will just discuss why um, why genetic testing should be done and how such genetic, genetic testing actually increases the survival of FH patients. And this is a graph. Uh, in the x-axis, you will um, the, this is the age of a patient, and uh, in y-axis, this is the cumulative LDLC levels in mg uh, per deciliter. So, this is a, if a patient or individual uh, known to be having LDL of uh, about in the range of uh, 150, he may have a higher risk for developing coronary artery diseases. So, for an uh, individual without having FH, uh, so he may have a he has a risk of developing such um, coronary artery disease risk at the age of around 55 years. And if you look at the same um, in the severe scenario, such as homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, where uh, the patient may develop such risk as early as 12.5 years of their age. And we come to the common, um, commonly seen heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. The patient, if, if he gets untreated, he may develop uh, such uh, risk uh, for developing coronary artery disease, uh, disease at the age of around 35 years. But if the diagnosis, if the patient has been diagnosed as early as around like 10 years of age and the treatment can be started at the time point itself, then he may lead a life which is actually similar to an uh, uh, individual without having FH that is around 53 years of age. If he, that, that risk has been postponed like around to uh, 53 years of his age. But if he miss in this uh, in his uh, in this age, at least if he could find uh, and diagnosis and treat the patient uh, as in the in his adult stage itself. So he may uh, have he may develop such risk at around 40 years of his age. So the take home message is that if we do the diagnosis early and start the treatment early itself, the patient may have a life which is uh, equivalent of an individual who is not having FH. So uh, by doing genetic testing, we can find the patient early uh, and also we can also start the treatment. So there are several genetic variant strategies have been uh, uh, de deployed for uh, FH. Starting with this is the microarray. Uh, for the so microarray has uh, only we can screen the fixed number of mutation. The diagnostic yield is very less, which is around 8.4%. But the sample throughput is high, but still uh, it can be uh, done only for the fixed number of mutation, not for the whole genes, particularly for our major genes. Uh, in go to Sanger sequencing, the diagnostic uh, yield has been increased at least, at least like 4 to 38% when compared to the microarray, but still the sample throughput is very low and that is very laborious. And only limited regions can be screened, not the um, whole gene. But if you have to screen the whole gene, it is a very laborious process. And uh, this is uh, the next one is the targeted next generation sequencing. The diagnostic yield is around 27 to 54 percent. The sample throughput is also high, and we can also like uh, screen a panel of genes. And for FH, this is one of the widely used method for uh, genetic diagnosis. Next one is a whole exome sequencing where we uh, sequence uh, all the exonic region of a uh, human genome uh, in the, from the patient. And the diagnostic is, is actually uh, similar to the targeted NGF that is around 20 to 
uh, vice versa, the similar sample throughput and uh, the is high, but the turnaround time is somewhat uh, late. And, and the last one uh, is the whole genome sequencing. Um, very limited studies uh, have been reported uh, uh, for using uh, by using a whole genome sequencing as a genetic diagnosis for FH because one um, there's a, most of the mutations are we seen in the in these major genes uh, and some in these major genes that's why no such discovery uh, has been made for discovery purpose it is useful but uh, uh, when uh, when you go for the sample throughput it is somewhat uh, medium and the turnaround time is also very high. So to overcome all these um, hurdles, um, there is one uh, sequencing strategy known as amplicon sequencing. The diagnostic yield is around as same as like uh, 24, 27 to 54%, uh, as same as, as like arbitrary NGS. The sa sample throughput is high, the turnaround time is also, also less, and we can screen the whole gene, uh, particularly the major genes. Um, so to we can so as, as I told you, the 30 million uh, people around uh, worldwide uh, need to be diagnosed for to do the diagnosis for such kind of large population, a uh, rapid and high throughput method is needed that can be overcome by such sequencing methods uh, like us, like um, as amplicon sequencing. And these are the general treatment uh, for family hypercholesterolemia. Uh, it includes starting from the lifestyle modification, that is eating uh, healthy food, exercising, uh, maintaining a healthy diet, and uh, regular checking of uh, the lipid profile, and avoiding smoking. And uh, since, uh, as I said earlier, this is a, uh, the patients will have a lifelong elevations of LDL uh, uh, since it is a genetic condition. This lifestyle modification will have a will reduce a small proportion of LDL. Uh, so a therap therapeutic in intervention is needed. The most widely used therapeutic intervention is the statin therapy, where depends upon the uh, LDL levels of the patient. A dosage uh, can be a statin dosage can be uh, given. And there are other uh, therapeutic in interventions also, such as like PCSK9 inhibitor, STMI, Blomita 5, Evinacover, uh, Evinacumab. And uh, this LDL apparatus and liver transplantations are done for severe cases. Uh, with this overview of familial hypercholesterolemia, so in IGAB, we have a consortium known as a Guardian Consortium, uh, where we take samples uh, from rare disease patients and we do sequencing and do. Uh, uh, data mining and also we uh, if uh, some novel variants have been identified, we'll translate uh, into a model organism and we will uh, finally uh, unravel the functional mechanism behind it. And as a part of Guardian Consortium, we are also collecting uh, samples uh, for FH. And uh, as I said earlier, the amplicon sequencing strategies uh, are being employed and data analysis genetic report will be done. If some mutations will be identified, they will be taken back to the model and some such as zebra fishes and functional consequence will be explored more. So I acknowledge uh, my uh, PI, Dr. Sridhar Sivasabhu and also Dr. Sridhar, uh, Dr. Vinod Skaria uh, for guiding all through these years and Rahul Bhai, Anushri Misha and all other, uh, all members from SSB uh, and VS lab members and all patients and families. I acknowledge uh, ICMR for my uh, SRF fellowship and the CSR IJP for the platform provided uh, for my research and also ICSF for my PhD. Thank you.